In part one, we talked about the big questions that archaeologists ask and the research methods we use to study ancient cities. Once we collect the data that we think will be meaningful, what does the process of analysis look like? How can students get involved? And what kinds of majors are useful for working in this field? Excavated artifacts are usually analyzed on site. In most cases, except for very small scientific samples, we can't remove artifacts from their country of origin, so we need to study them as completely as possible. Where I work on the island of Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean, we can't even move artifacts to a different part of the island without permission from the government. Studying artifacts in the field means cleaning, drawing, photographing them, and in some cases, even creating 3D models. We can increasingly conduct scientific analyses in the field as well. For example, tools like portable X-ray fluorescence devices can tell us the elemental composition of an artifact without damaging it. Usually, archaeological projects are collaborative endeavors, and artifacts are studied by a specialist who knows how to analyze that particular type of material or artifact. My project, for example, includes a geomorphologist who's studying our soils on site to give us a sense for how the landscape has changed over the last 6,000 years. A ceramicist who studies our pottery in order to understand how pottery was produced and used. A lithicist who's looking at how our stone tools were made and used. And an archaeometallurgist who's examining our metal objects. And finally, an archaeobotanist who's studying the plant remains that we recover. Specialists like these usually come to the field to carry out their analyses. Then when they return to their home institutions, they'll write up reports that incorporate information from other sites so we can get a sense for how our site compares to others in the same region or that date to the same time period. Because archaeology is a subfield of anthropology, most archaeology courses at NC State are found in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. However, Three of the professors in the history department are also archaeologists, and so you can also find courses about the ancient world in the history department, too. If you've taken some archaeology courses, and you want to decide if a career in archaeology might be a good choice for you, you should consider an archaeological field school, where you learn archaeological research methods like survey, excavation, and analysis in a hands-on fashion. That is, by actually doing these things. We offer a field school every summer as part of my project in Cyprus. It's a five-week study abroad course worth six credits in anthropology or history. We're pretty flexible. <laughs> However, you can also join field schools in virtually any part of the world, including right here in North Carolina. If your field school offers academic credits, check to see if they can count for the archaeology field school course here at NC State. Very often they do. You should also think about volunteering in a lab on campus or helping a professor conduct research here in Raleigh, both of which can be valuable experiences that can help you decide if archaeology is the right path for you. The focus of this course is global change. So what role have cities played, or what role will cities play, in humanity's alteration of the Earth's environment? We tend to think of human alteration of the environment as a recent phenomena, but it certainly isn't. For example, much of the Middle East was forested until about 6,000 years ago, when an increased need for wood to fuel fires led to regional deforestation, a process that has increased the aridity and erosion of the region. This increased need for wood fuels came from rising population levels, but also the invention of metalworking, which required fires at a very high temperature, and from the mass production of ceramic vessels. Both of these production processes were carried out on massive industrial scales in the earliest cities of the Middle East. But it wasn't only deforestation that led to alteration of the environment. The congregation of vast numbers of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands, in tightly packed cities also led to a need to intensify agricultural production. That is, to produce more food in the same amount of space. This intensification meant that farmers had to increase their efforts to irrigate the land and to fertilize it. In so doing, huge amounts of farmland became salinized or overly salty. Even today, large areas of what could otherwise be farmland in southern Iraq are covered in a thick layer of white salt, the remains of past farming practices. And fixing such soil damage is incredibly difficult and expensive. 
In the Middle East, ancient cities themselves often became a part of the landscape, both physically altering it and playing a role in how people would use the land for millennia to come. This is because the main building material in the ancient Middle East was unbaked mud bricks, like adobe, which erode and decay even with regular maintenance. This means that buildings periodically had to be torn down and new ones built. In this process, the cities themselves began to form mounds, with successive new buildings built on the remains of earlier ones. Because agricultural land was valuable, people continued to live in these densely packed mounds, rather than spreading out into the countryside. Now, millennia later, these mounds dot the landscape. Many mounds have become cemeteries in recent years. The mounds are too steep to farm, and so they make a good place to bury the dead without taking up any of the local agricultural land. Other mounds have small villages perched at their tops. Just as in antiquity, people today prefer to make their homes in spaces that can't otherwise be used for growing crops. Some mounds even remain unoccupied completely, although that's changing as populations grow in the Middle East. But with these tall mounds poking up out of flat agricultural lands, and indeed in the middle of some cities, the Middle East still has stark visual reminders of the ancient cities that once flourished there. So what solutions to the wicked problems posed by cities have we come up with, and what are we still working on? Many of the wicked problems posed by cities that archaeologists tackle have to do with the fact that many, although certainly not all, of the ancient cities that we study have been abandoned. So what caused these abandonments and what lessons can we learn from them? Are our cities doomed to the same fate? Certainly, the ancient inhabitants of the region understood many of the ecological impacts that their urbanization and agricultural intensification had, and they did take many steps to mitigate these, including things like rotating crops through fields annually and keeping a system of fallowing, where the fields are allowed to sit empty for a year. But ultimately, many of these cities were abandoned, and there doesn't seem to be any one root cause. Here's an example of this. About 20 years ago, an influential theory argued that around the year 2200 BC, more or less, our chronology even with radiocarbon dating is still far from precise, most of the cities in the region, that is today, northern Iraq and eastern Syria, were simultaneously abandoned because of a major climatic event. This theory inspired a lot of subsequent research in the region, and led to a more nuanced and diverse set of hypotheses. Today, the cause of the collapse of that urban system is hypothesized to be many things. Climate change that brought decreased agricultural yields, the political instability of an invading empire from a different region, or even internal social troubles within that region. Some have even questioned the basic premise of the problem, arguing that while some sites were abandoned around 2200 BC, others had been abandoned long before, and a handful were never abandoned at all. Some sites showed evidence of violent warfare. Others showed evidence of aridification and agricultural problems. No two sites have proven to be the same. So the archeological narrative today has changed to incorporate far more nuance, even within a seemingly circumscribed region like this. My own perspective on this topic is that we need to emphasize the diversity of cities, even within a bounded region. When we look ahead to the future of cities in our contemporary world, one of the things that archeology span can show us is that there's no one right way to be a city. Cities don't just spring up out of thin air. They're the result of deep historical and cultural processes in place long before the roads and walls are built. The more we explore ancient cities, the more we learn about this diversity. Some are short-lived, others last for thousands of years. But it's an ongoing project to understand what differentiates the lifespan of these cities and what makes a city sustainable. In the search for those answers, archaeology gives us a unique perspective based on both deep time and comparative examples from cultures around the world.